Right, stage four, Mr. Bitsky. My Lord, before I turn to stage four, um, there was a question that your Lordship asked me earlier about an entry on the IS-91, but I don't think I understood the purpose of, my, of your Lordship's question, and it would help you point it out to me over lunch. The IS-91 was the checkbox form that was on the date of the 27th of January, and your Lordship asked me about the checkbox that says uh, violence towards or assault towards others being the need. Uh, sorry, on, on others. Um, the purpose of that assessment is not to determine whether to detain, but where to detain. If necessary, I can show you where that's clear from the general detention policy. But if time is short, I can also just give you the references. So there is a risk assessment carried out about risks posed in detention. And it's something that goes to a department called Death Blue, who are uh, tasked with allocating people to different detention settings. And uh, the relevant passages are in Chapter 55 of the Enforcement Instructions and uh, 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 Enforcement Instructions and Guidance, Tab 42 of Authority 2. And the relevant passages run from page 23 to 24, 25. But we say it's quite clear there that this is about administrative decisions about allocating detainees to particular settings. Um, so I shall turn now to period four. And could I ask you to turn up, please, the party's agreed chronology? That is in the core bundle. And could I ask you to turn to page 160? What's this document? This is an agreed chronology, so agreed between the parties. <coughs> and it's to try and move through the facts with as much speed as we can. Um, Page 160. Yes. Yes. So, some relevant entries just before period four. On 5th of March, the defendant sets direction for the claimant's removal. That's the penultimate entry on page 160. And then, top of the 10th of top of uh, page 161, claimant lodges an appeal. And then, 11th of March, we issue this claim for judicial review. Yes. And uh, not in dispute and uh, acknowledged by the deputy judge, that of course constituted a barrier to removal. So once the judicial review had been issued, either the claimant had to have his appeal in the United Kingdom or the judicial review of the certificate which allowed him to be removed before uh, the, the, the final determination of the appeal uh, would have had to be upheld in judicial review. One, one of those two things would have had to have happened. Yes. And then 12th of March, uh, removal directions are cancelled. Yes. And I'm just going to take you very quickly to what the original claim looked like. It was subsequently amended, but it gives some indication of what sort of claim was being dealt with. And um, if you could look at supplementary bundle, please, uh, page 124. I show you in particular paragraphs one and three of the introduction. So this is pages one, two, five to one, two, six. So this is the original claim, and you'll see that it's raising what were then new points of law concerning how the Secretary of State uh, was entitled to exercise its certification power uh, and 
uh, which was uh, relatively newly introduced at that point, and uh, the lawfulness of the uh, defendant's policy concerning certification. So uh, we point out, of course, that parts of this have been vindicated. For example, the deputy judge did find that the certification applied to the wrong legal test. The consequence, of course, we say in that reasoning would have been that the policy was unlawful. Um, but he also found that uh, it, uh, that error had not been material. Um, but the other point we make, of course, this, this was a relatively complex claim. It wasn't one that was uh, on its face going to move uh, at speed. So why did the Secretary of State maintain the claimant's detention once removal directions had been cancelled on the 12th of March? And we, in the classification that the parties have, a joint, have agreed on, period four runs from the 12th of March. It's not, not identical to the stages adopted by the deputy judge below. Um, but the indication of the defendant's thinking is at supplementary bundle uh, page 157. And this is a letter that the defendant wrote on the 16th of March explaining why it was not going to release the claimant, even though uh, he had brought a claim to official review. So, at page 157, and at the second paragraph, we have the by now uh, familiar assertion, com convicted of a serious offence, sentence reflects this, doesn't have an extensive criminal record, uh, but the uh, uh, serious harm which would be caused as a result of any similar instances of offending as such, it's not considered reasonable to leave the public vulnerable to the potential for your client to reoffend. Um, then, uh, if you uh, look down the next paragraph, uh, it's said that the uh, claimant's detention is necessary, but that necessity is explained in terms that might, of course, apply to any deportee uh, necessary for the prevention of crime and disorder in the wider public interest. Um, and the, there is then an assessment of the responding risk in the next paragraph, but based solely on the fact that there are uh, outstanding deportation proceedings uh, and notwithstanding that there is an outstanding appeal and outstanding claim for judicial review. Uh, no consideration in this letter or the terms of detention, save that in the third to last paragraph, uh, it said that um, a temporary admission should be refused for this reason alone, that the claimant failed to supply a release address. Now, it, it was, uh, as um, your lordships and your ladyship will have noted from the judgment, it was conceded in a separate claim for judicial review that there had in fact been an unlawful refusal of bail accommodation, although that too was considered to be immaterial uh, by the deputy judge. And in fact, the context of this claim is a litany of errors that are now established in part by the deputy judge below and in part in distinct proceedings uh, relating to the defendant's treatment of the claimant in the early months of 2015. Um, so if you now turn please to page 169 of the supplementary bond but if I could ask you to keep the chronology open so this is now the detention review of the 23rd of March, the next detention review after the claim for judicial review has been issued and the uh, removal has been stayed. And while we are here, could I show you on page 169 the bases of the assessments, so there's a table at page 169, the penultimate entry risk of absconding medium due to use of offensive weapon and the sentence received. So still reasoning that is based squarely upon the title of the conviction and the sentence received. Risk of reoffending, medium. He was convicted of use of offensive weapon and he was sentenced to 14 months of imprisonment. Risk of harm, medium. He was convicted of use of offensive weapon and he was sentenced to 14 months imprisonment. Mm -hmm. 
and if you look at 171 entries number 8 and 9 you will see the same reasoning and then over the page at 172 could I show you point number 16 action plan for next review awaiting outcome of JR no action plan And at the end of 172, we've got he's subject to a signed deportation order and removal directions can be set once there is an outcome on judicial review. Well, it must mean if there is an outcome adverse to the claimant. Um, page 173, and this is now... Box, relevant box, box on page 170, that's found in various deportations. First, the JR, it says that that's the barrier to removal. Expected date of resolution three months. Yes. Yes. That's the relevant yes. box. Yes, it's subject to the point that comes next, though, which is not clear whether that is based upon expedition. Potentially, that expectation is based upon an assumption that the claim could be expedited, as we shall see from the authorising officer's comments. But I just no, no, I, I understand yes, that yes, because yes. it's very unlikely I would have thought that the claim for judicial review would get to three months without expedition. But that, that's that's yes. the box, isn't it? Yes, yes, yes. quite similar. Thank, thank you. Um, could, and, and actually, I'm coming on to the point of expedition, and, and as your lordship says, it's hard to see how the three month ex, uh, uh, assessment can be based on anything else than this. So, this is the authorising officer's signature, James Holton, and he's AD's assistant director. And he says, this is top of page 173, we need to ensure this JR is expedited as quickly as possible and ensure that this does not result in a, result in a substantial delay in his deportation. I shall raise this with the AD for the JR senior assistant director. Mr. AD Lawson, is who? Assistant director. The assistant? Director. Of what? Uh, well, so, it, it, and I'm sure Mr. Anson will correct me if I'm misunderstanding, but these are different <laughs> arms of the Secretary of State's department. So yeah, we've got that. Just, who is the Assistant Director? Of the I beg your pardon. The Assistant Director is of the JR team, the Judicial Review team. So the Assistant Director, with responsibility for detention decisions, is saying, I'll contact my colleague who deals with decisions about expedition. And... Could, yes. yes, and could, could I also just show you the next paragraph? He was convicted of a serious offence for which he is assessed as a medium risk of harm to the public. It was his first offence, so it's unclear whether he is likely to offend again. This is making the point that I was making earlier for me, that there's no analysis of likelihood, nor could there be, based on the detention in the deten information the detention review, although he has been assessed as posing a medium risk of reoffending. And then, it, and then the assessment of that he may pose a high risk of, of absconding is based upon the fact that he has brought a claim for judicial review. So he's exercising rights, uh, both in domestic law and as it happens under Article 31 of the Citizens Directive, to seek a remedy against interim expulsion. Um, he might, and that was the reason I was saying this morning, there is an absconding assessment, uh, but an inadequate one, an unlawful one. But the, well, the it's, not, it's not correct to say that the JR demonstrates he poses a high risk of absconding. That is linked to his wish not to be deported. Yes, uh, but, but it, quite so. But, but if the exercise of remedies in domestic law and also, I emphasise, in the Citizens Directive, Article 31 Citizens Directive, a person can seek uh, interim relief against the potential of being removed before the final determination of their appeal against deportation. If the exercise of those rights is treated as evidence of an absconding risk and therefore justification for further detention, that would be very troubling. But that is actually, I, I'm speaking parenthetically here because the point that I really wanted to show you is the last one in this box, 
which is that the assessment of timing is subject to expedition. Should the JR be dealt with quickly, then deportation can take place within a reasonable time scale. So the logical corollary is, should the JR not be capable of being dealt with quickly, or should it not be dealt with quickly for whatever reason, then deportation cannot take place within a reasonable time scale. And, uh, and as I shall show you shortly, that was how the deputy judge saw it. He considered but the question of expedition was central because absent expedition, there was no realistic prospect of removal within a reasonable period. But in fact, the claim was not expedited and there's no evidence that there was ever any communication about expedition between the defendant's two arms, the JR team and the detainers. Um, and if you could turn back please to the chronology, now at page 161, the next key entry is the 30th of March, the acknowledgement of service in this claim, so that's right at the bottom. And so that is filed and served with no request for expedition. And it will be recalled that the claim for judicial review was lodged on the 11th of March, so the defendant had 21 days until the 1st of April to file its acknowledgement of service, and it waited until two days before that outer limit to file its acknowledgement of service. Could I ask you now um, to keep the chronology open, but to turn up the defendant's policy on what it will do if it is expedited, if it is expediting a claim for judicial review. Um, this is in Authorities Volume 2, Tab 43. So this gives guidance to the to JR caseworkers on what to do when expediting. And uh, if you could turn, please, to page 17, and this is 9.1, preparing the judicial review documentation. There are 21 days for the acknowledgement of service, but under the expedited process, the JR caseworker will normally instruct... Page you are? I'm so sorry, 17. 17? 17 of tab 43 in authorities too. Tab 43? Yes. Okay. So this is chapter 60 of the enforcement instructions and guidance. This is the published policy that was enforced at the time of the claimant's attention, in fact still now, I think, um, yes. concerning uh, judicial review. And at 9.1, the first paragraph under the 9.1 heading, it said 21 days for the acknowledgement of service, but under the expedited process, the JR caseworker would normally instruct the TESOL to lodge our grounds of defence much earlier. The JR caseworker must make sure the file is ready and prepared to provide our additional information. And then if you could turn, please, to page 19, three paragraphs from the bottom, And it's the passage in bold. Any delay in obtaining the file may lead to a case being rejected from expedition <coughs> if further evidence of the file is needed to make a decision on expedition. JR caseworkers will aim to lodge an acknowledgement of service and grounds for defence within seven days where expedition is deemed appropriate and the person is detained. So ordinarily, within seven days, of the claim being issued on the 11th of March, expedition would have been uh, uh, expedition would have been sought and the acknowledgement service filed. And if you could turn back, please, to the chronology now, at the top of page 162. had two claims for judicial review. This one, which challenged the certificate and the detention, and also the distinct claim for judicial review concerning the refusal of bail accommodation, <coughs> which, as I mentioned earlier, uh, was conceded by the Secretary of State. And 
the, the claimants sought interim relief in those two linked claims um, uh, in the form of an order requiring him to be granted a bail address and released. Two OASIS reports were sent to the claimant the day before the hearing of, the claimant, of, 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 of that claim for interim relief, and they were promptly forwarded by the claimant solicitor to the defendant. Um, and uh, note, <coughs> please, just the second sentence of that entry in the chronology, the first OASIS report was dated the 31st of December 2014. So they were, that along with the pre-sentencing report was in existence over three weeks before the claimant's detention started. Um, and because the second OASIS report, without any explanation on the face of the report, adjusted one of the risk assessments, it was the risk assessment to known adult was adjusted upwards, and so uh, the claimant needed more time to try and investigate with the National Offender Management Service what the basis was for that revised assessment, and the interim relief hearing, as you can see on the 31st of March, was adjourned. Now, uh, importantly, again, the Secretary of State, uh, uh, represented by uh, Council Mr. Anderson at that hearing, does not seek expedition. And that's a, a second chance to yes. ask uh, at the application before Mrs. Justice McCarland. Precisely, my lord, and and that's the moment which. Um, I would ask you to turn to the deputy judge's reasoning about here uh, about uh, period four. If you could turn, please, to the judgment, paragraph eighty. So this is page two hundred three of the core bundle. When, when the judge, when the deputy judge is stage four, we've now subdivided that into period four and period five. Um, so at 81, we can see that the deputy judge, and this is the last sentence, says that it's from 11th of March 2015, the circumstances were different because now there was a judicial review challenge of a certification decision which constituted a barrier to uh, removal. And at 80 Roman numeral 2, the deputy judge considered, con considers that the 23rd of March detention review, that was Assistant Director Holden, uh, dealt wholly convincingly with the question of prospect of removal within a reasonable time because the need to expedite was recognized. And so the deputy judge says, expedition was a real prospect at that stage. The acknowledgement service was due on the 30th of March, and all the relief hearing was in due course fixed for the 31st of March, albeit not a commission hearing. I'm satisfied that there was a need for expedition, but there was, as at 23rd of March, the prospect of securing it. And that last sentence, I am satisfied, uh, makes clear how critical the issue of expedition is. Um, so, when does the deputy judge consider that there's no longer a real prospect of expedition? Well, that is answered in the next paragraph, Little Roman numeral 3, at the bottom of page 203, from the second sentence onwards. So, he says, by the time of the immigration officer Foster's authorization for detention on 9th of April review, the situation had changed. The opportunity had been missed. For reasons which are unexplained, the securing of expedition and judicial view had not been followed up. So there is a factual finding, there is no follow-up after Assistant Director Holden's comments. The acknowledgement of service contained no request for expedition, nor were directions sought. Well, there's no um, uh, dispute about this part, is there? No. No. So, uh, uh, taking stock, you say uh, that... Uh, uh, he ought to have been released when? My Lord, here too we have a maximalist and a minimalist submission. I, what I'm actually going to do is take them the other way around. I'll start with the minimalist submission. I'll, 
Uh, no, the maximum is, is, put your case at its highest first. The, the, the minimalist submission can be got out of the way quite quickly, and it goes, it's directly on this point of paragraph 83. I think is, I understand that. Yes, it's the 30th uh, of March, or perhaps the 31st, when expedition was missed, yes. opportunity was missed. Yes, yes I yes, understand sir. that. Right, take your maximalist uh, submission. So, can I, can I just finish just what the deputy judge says, and then I'll come to the maximalist submission. But we have seen what the deputy judge said. It, so, can I just show you... Um, over the page, I just wanted to highlight well, as this. As I say, this is a point you won on. You don't have to tell us how marvellously you won all the time. Well, no, my lord, we didn't win on this. So, so to be clear, the deputy judge considered that detention remained lawful yes. from the 12th of March until the 9th of April. Yes. And our minimalist submission is, if you look at the top of page 204, those circumstances, in my judgment, and that refers to the acknowledgement of service containing no request for expedition, nor directions for expedition being sought on the 31st of March. Those circumstances, in my judgment, meant that it was now apparent and ought to have been recognized that removal could not take place within a reasonable time. That is the hard you'll sing three limit. Yes. So the deputy judge makes a clear finding that the hard you'll, that the Elements of the Hard You'll Sing 3 principle are in place by the 31st of March. So our minimalist submission that I will come back to um, is simply how could detention as a matter of legal principle or policy conceivably have remained lawful once the Hard You'll Sing principle had on the deputy judge's own analysis been reached on the 31st of March. So he, so we, we didn't win on this. We, 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 he didn't take the 31st of March. He took the 9th of April. So we, we've we lost on this whole period. And our minimalist After submission... Yes, yes, yes. 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 Um, so... And, and it, just before leaving the judgment, just to avoid having to come back to it, can I highlight also the last part of subparagraph 4? So this is Roman numeral 4. And this is again showing that for the deputy judge, the crucial issue is the opportunity for expedition being missed. The judicial review is about removal, proactive steps are necessary to pursue expedition, and the opportunity had inexplicably been allowed to pass by. Deportation could take place depending on whether the decision to JR was adverse, but the reasonable time scale would then depend on the time scale for final resolution of the judicial review. That by now has not been expedited. But so we say. The decisive circumstances that meant that the Hardial Singh 3 limit was reached were in place by the 31st of March. Yes. And that's your minimalist submission. Before before I leave that, before I leave the deputy judge's analysis, um, I, I would like to ask you please to turn in core bundle uh, Back to page two, uh, so forward to page two hundred six. So this is just moving on two pages from where we are now in the judgment. This is the grant of permission. And could I ask you to look, please? at bullet point three, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, bullet point two, as to the claimant's ground two. So as to the claimant's ground two, my view is that uh, judgment eight is a fact-specific conclusion involving no general grace period. But taking the review date, the 9th of April 2015, rather than the 31st of March 15, in light of high court authority, and then he cites passages of his own judgment, has a realistic prospect and engages a point of principle. So the deputy judge is saying there is a question of principle as to which of those two dates defines the end of lawful detention. Is it the 31st of March by which both opportunities to expedite have been missed, or is it the detention review? So this isn't 
a case, as the defendant has sought to persuade the court, of unlawful detention gently shading into unlawful detention, as happens very frequently in the assessment of the reasonable period under the Hardwick Singh principles. This is the question where the judge, the deputy judge himself, acknowledges there's a question of principle. Do I, does the detention remain lawful until the next detention review? And he thought that High Court authority uh, supported him uh, in that. Um, it, 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 he, uh, if it's of uh, interest, the two cases that he is referring to, they're not in the authorities bundle uh, because the parties were in agreement that they didn't add. Um, one is called Kadir, and the relevant passages of Kadir, uh, uh, Kadir, sorry, it's a first instance judgment. The relevant passages are cited by the deputy judge uh, at uh, paragraph 52 of the judgment. The other one is the case of Tsaduvaris, where there is actually no reasoning on whether it's the detention review or the uh, precipitating event uh, that should uh, mark the end of lawful detention. And could I take you to please to an important point of common ground that can be seen in core bundle at page 56? So this is the defendant's response to our challenge on period four. And if you could look at paragraph 65, the penultimate sentence, the question whether the Hajjul Singh principles have been breached is an objective one, not dependent on the state of mind of Secretary of State's officials. And then paragraph 66, second sentence, the Secretary of State did not argue below and does not argue now but the question whether and if so when there is a breach of the Hardwell Singh principles will necessarily coincide with the periods of the detention review. And, but that is of course precisely how the Deputy Judge viewed it. We say that's clear from the reasoning and the judgment but if we're left in any doubt it's also clear for his reasons in granting permission, which we respectfully say the court is entitled to take into account on the same way well, that the, the court... Secretary of State is not taking the point, we need to hear no more about it. Well, the Secretary of State says that's not what the Deputy Judge did. And we yeah. say, well, that's essentially what the Secretary of State concedes here, is that if the Deputy Judge treated the detention review as a matter of principle, as the end point, and not the precipitating circumstances, under the Hardy or Singh principle, then that would be an error of law. That's the defendant's concession. We say, well, it's very important to us because that's exactly what the deputy judge did do. And that's clear. That supports your minimalist submission, yes. Precisely so, yes. Uh, and, and we say, of course, that nothing changed between the 31st of March when the opportunities have been missed and the detention review. And but why should it have been released any earlier? My Lord, earlier, earlier than the 31st of March. Yes. Yeah. Um, and when? My Lord, we say on the 12th of March or shortly thereafter because the claim for judicial review is issued on the 11th by the 12th removal directions have been cancelled. And when I say shortly thereafter, it of course embraces the possibility that the court may say, well, under the defendant's own policy, and also as a matter of logic, if it's going to expedite it, we better get on with it. The court wouldn't look very kindly on a request for expedition <coughs> on the last days in which the admonishment of service was due. So, so your maximalist submission is that once the uh, removal directions have been cancelled, he should have been released. Or shortly thereafter. Or shortly it's, it's, it's not quite as hard as he had to be released on X date. As we, we do see that it might be said, well, there could be a short period, but it must short have... Short period for doing what? To decide whether to expedite. What? To decide whether to expedite. Now, to decide whether to expedite the, the, the claim for judicial review. Um, 
turning now to the maximalist submission, which I know is the point that my Lord wants me to, to address now. The lacuna here of witness evidence is again important. And could I ask you to turn up, please, in Authorities 2 at tab 31, the case of Das? Do we need authority for the proposition that witness evidence is important? My Lord, it goes further than that, if I, if I may say so. So, it, paragraph. What, what, what is the proposition you want to cite it for? If I could read from Mr. Johnson. No, Sarah's just tell us what the proposition is for which you wish to cite this case. Adverse inferences, my Lord, but it's proper in judicial review. Particularly, we would say, where a deprivation of liberty is at stake and where questions of EU necessity are at stake, that's my own addition. Uh, but in judicial review, where the Secretary of State uh, clearly uh, bears the uh, duty to the court uh, 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 in, in public law challenges, adverse inferences are properly to be drawn from a failure to submit witness evidence. So what Mr. Justice Sales is saying, and this then needs uh, approval from the Court of Appeal in Das, is that there is a particularly strong case, I'm sure I'm not quite paraphrasing this eloquently, but yes. a, a, a particularly strong well, case. I'd be very surprised if that's contested. Let's leave it there. We'll see if it is contested. Um, turning back to our submission, We say there are only three explanations for what happened uh, in the claimant's case before the 31st of March. Yes, presumably your primary case, you don't have to go into explanations. You, your primary case, as I understand it, is that he should have been released when the removal directions were cancelled, with perhaps a little bit of time for uh, a consideration of whether expedition was to be applied for or not. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah, but that's I, I, perfectly... Uh, understandable submission. Why do you need to go into explanations? We, what, what we have said is what are all the logical explanations for what happened? Either uh, the defendant's JRT decided not to seek expedition, that the detaining offic officials did not know this. So Assistant Director Holton, in good faith, is simply ignorant of the fact that the decision to do anything taken not to expedite. Or the JR team simply didn't turn its mind to expedition, and the detaining officials didn't know this. But there's no evidence that expedition was ever considered by anyone other than Assistant Director Holton. And the final inference, which of course we, we don't urge upon you and we don't need to, but it's just saying, look, here are all the available possibilities. The final one is that it would, would be that the JR team decided against expedition or neglected to consider it, the detaining officials became aware of it, but still continued to detain on the basis that expedition could be possible. And what the defendant says to this is, ah, oh, yes, well, miscommunication is the right, ad is the right inference to draw, uh, or a proper inference to draw. And we quite agree that it's a proper inference on these facts to say one arm of the Home Office had no idea of what the other was doing. And the question then arises of whether that's a defense, a defense to the tort of false imprisonment. And we say, can't be, for the following reasons. First, as the defendant rightly accepts in the passage I showed you in, in Mr. Anderson's skeleton, the hard sin principles set an objective standards. They don't depend on the state of mind of a detainer. So given that there's no evidence that expedition was ever in fact considered, then there was not, in fact, a realistic prospect. Well, again, you're dealing with an argument that's not yet been made, aren't you? You're dealing with an yes. argument that's not yet been made. I think the time has come when Mr. Anderson should stand up and uh, address the questions that you've posed. My Lord, may, may, may I just have a few more moments and, and very quickly finish my submissions on period four, because they're, they're very shortly taken? Well, very few. We have your submissions now. You've also made them in writing in detail. In fact, the three alternatives you were identifying, we have them in writing and in detail. 
May I, may I request the court's indulgence for three minutes to, to complete the point? Right. My Lord, we, we do say, of course, that this is a tort of strict liability. Honest mistake, miscommunication are not defences. Evans number two. Uh, we also say that if the defendant is right and there was a communication failure, so that the detainers thought that the other arm of the Home Office was considering expedition, but got that wrong. That would be a material public court error. It would give rise in itself to liability on the Lumber and Batsy principles. And the next point, of course, only one Secretary of State. So everybody was exercising cultural functions. But we Secretary understand State. what you're saying about this. You don't have to repeat it all the time. I, I beg your pardon. The, the last point is about rewarding communication failures. And can I just end with this example? So suppose you have two factually material, uh, factually materially identical detention cases. And in both cases, the detainees have brought claims for judicial review that constitute barriers to removal. And in both cases, the only way in which there can be removal within a reasonable period is if there is expedition. And in both cases, let's suppose, the JR team in fact take a look at it Take a look at the claim since it's far too complicated, not appropriate for expedition, we're not going to seek expedition. In case A, the, uh, the, commun the Home Office detaining officials do communicate uh, with it's the JRT. It's hopelessly elaborate, if I may say so. Your point is there was just nothing done, and that is enough for you. I think, really, we're going to ask you to sit down and we'll have Mr. Hanson on his feet. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Hanson. My Lord, my lady, thank you. Would you prefer for me to address you on the Hardwell Singh issue first, as we've just heard? We'd like to address us on stage one first, and then stage four, and then advance your own appeal. Thank you, my lord. My lord, one other question I just wanted to ask, and that is in relation to time. I'm conscious you've uh, indicated earlier that you consider this to be an appeal as a one-day case rather than a two-day case. I just wanted to check whether the court was... Uh, no, you must have the time that is necessary. We don't believe that more than a day is necessary, but it may be that it is. I'm grateful. Well, turning then to the first period, um, and if I can first of all just um, address you in relation to the um, relevant legal principles. Um, it's common ground that Article 27 of the Citizens Directive applies in relation to the decision to detain. It's common ground that there is a test in EU law of proportionality, and that in considering proportionality, the court will be asking whether or not a particular measure is necessary. There are, though, a number of differences in emphasis and understanding of how Article 27 applies in the present case. First, in my submission, member states do enjoy a wide margin of appreciation in terms of their implementation of the Citizens Directive. And that was accepted in the Supreme Court by both Lord Clark and Lord Karma in the decision in uh, Nuasli. Uh, the, if I take you to that decision, uh, it's at tab 33 the authorities bundle. I don't understand your submission at the moment. You say that member states have a ma margin of appreciation in the terms of implementation of the Citizen Directive. Yes. We have implemented the Citizen Directive. Yes. Whether we've adopted a margin of appreciation or not does not matter. Uh, we have the, uh, the regulations and as you say in No Asley they have said uh, that the regulations comply with the uh, Directive. Yes. Yes. What more do you need than that? Um, well, m my lord, I, I don't think I do need much more than that, but I simply say that in terms of how Article 27 will apply, one always has to have regard to the specific context in which a particular uh, provision uh, arises. And in the present case, that context isn't what one might think of as being the classic restriction in terms of freedom of movement of an expulsion decision, but a decision to detain a person pending consideration of whether or not they're a person who should be removed on grounds of public um, of public policy. 
And as your Lordship has indicated, the Supreme Court in uh, Nuasli um, uh, accepted that it was plain that the uh, powers that state, member states have under the Citizens Directive extended to the use of a power to, uh, to detain for that, um, for that purpose. Um, uh, and it, so it simply, um, it simply goes to that uh, issue. And I see that when you're looking at what's required in order to satisfy the requirements of Article 27, one has to bear in mind the fact that the decision being taken in the present case to detain pending determination of removal on the grounds of public policy is in EU law terms a more limited decision than the uh, expulsion decision itself. And so in considering whether or not its requirements are satisfied, it may be that less information is required in order to justify the initial decision to detain pending further inquiries than would be required, for example, in order to justify the expulsion itself. It's not a matter of derogating from Article 27, and the judge didn't, in his judgment, suggest that he considered that it was a matter of derogating from Article 27, but rather recognizing that the application of those requirements has to be context sensitive. And in the present case, a crucial aspect of the context was the fact that the Secretary of State was first informed of this uh, individual on the day on which he fell due to be released as a consequence of the fact that his sentence meant that he was eligible for release because of time already spent on remand. And how was the Secretary of State informed? The um, of the prison does he, before he releases any prisoner, uh, informs the Secretary of State if he, the Governor, thinks the Secretary of State might wish to detain them? How does it work? Um, my Lord, I, I, I believe he's informed um, by the Ministry of Justice from the court rather than from the prison, but there wasn't specific evidence as to the precise method of communication. What we've got is the uh, GCID notes, um, which were taken to uh, by my Lord's friend uh, for the um, 27th of February, which appear uh, in the supplementary bundle um, at uh, SB 249. Um, and so the first, the Secretary of State comes to know of this particular individual is when they're informed that he's received 40 months in prison for possession of imitation uh, firearm, that his time served and being held at court uh, and due for release. You see it then indicates that the caseworker, Ms. Fleming, contacted um, the offender management unit at HMP Norwich, uh, asking if he'd received the 40 months in one hit, i.e. if that was uh, the um, uh, sentence in, in this particular single occasion, and that was confirmed. Um, a phone call was then made um, informing them of imminent release. We don't know how Mr Fleming thought to, came into Mr Fleming's mind that it would be a good idea uh, to contact whoever OMU is at Norwich Prison. Well, my, my, my Lord, other than the, the note that they're following whatever process was in, was in place. My, my Lord, no, but I... We'll, we'll see Just a bit in the dark as to why Miss Fleming, if she is a lady, uh, 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 thought this would be a good idea. A good idea in terms of contacting the... Yeah. Well, that's in, in relation to seeking information from HMP Norwich as to the um, circumstances... Of Somebody the must have uh, contacted the Home Office Yes. Uh, uh, on the day of the sentencing. Yes, so the, 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 the CCD2, which is referred to at... Um, 249, but isn't a document um, which um, has been seen in these proceedings is a referral uh, is a referral form that would have been provided to the Secretary of State. And you'll see it also then refers to the, the PNC, which would be a reference to print up from the Police National. What's uh, CCD2? Th that, my Lord, is the referral form to the Secretary of State uh, from the Ministry of Justice indicating that there's uh, foreign national 
offender. Um, Do we have a copy of that? My, my lord, we don't. No, that that, that document was never um, uh, identified in these uh, in these proceedings. What we do have uh, are the documents to which you were taken earlier by Mr. Vinsky in relation to the initial decision to detain on the 27th. Um, and you'll see that the judge, in his judgment, made um, a factual finding that there had been a decision um, <coughs> taken. If I take you to the judge's judgment, um, just in terms of the approach that he took to the, um, uh, the evidence, it's, this is now the core. Well, what's all this business about walking documents down to Susie? That, that, my lord, is, 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 as I understand, we, we don't have any further information as to, as to those documents other than that being the, the Police National Computer Printout and the CCD2 referral. So the Secretary of State accepted before the judge that we don't have, or that there wasn't um, more material on which the Secretary of State could rely for the purposes of this claim than what the court has um, what the court What, has what appears to have happened is that this chap was sentenced to 14 months imprisonment uh, on the 27th. Um, uh, that appears to have been unexpected at least by the uh, secretary. Um, uh, he was held at court, so presumably somebody at court uh, contacted the Secretary of State. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, uh, then the paperwork was done uh, to detain him administratively. Yes, um, my lord, when you say, yes, when you say unexpected by the, the Home Secretary, this was the first the Home Secretary had ever heard of this individual. So it's not as though, uh, as it were, the the Home Secretary had previously been no, on notice. Yes. It's the first, the first time the Home Secretary... It's the first time the Home Secretary ever heard hears of this individual. That's right, my lord, yes. Um, that's the... Um, uh, that's the nub of the situation. Um, uh, and that is a factor which the judge had regard to in considering um, whether or not um, the requirements of Article 27 were satisfied in relation to day one. And in my submission, he was right to have regard to that factor. If you look at what he says at paragraph 59, and this is in the core bundle, um, at page So paragraph 59, if you look at um, uh, 5.5 onwards, you'll see that he accepted that the decisions at stage 1 and 2 were focusing on what was known about the claimant's individual case and circumstances, and that detention was not treated as automatically following from the fact of his being a convicted criminal. And then at 6... He agrees that it's important in considering whether legally adequate evidence and reasons were present for detention of the individual to pay close regard to context, circumstances, and practical realities. And he agreed that the law should not impose an impossible burden or place the Secretary of State in an invidious position where circumstances of urgency necessarily mean that only limited information about the individual is available. And that reference to the circumstances of urgency, meaning that only limited information available, is precisely to the fact that the first that the Secretary of State comes to know of this individual is the communication on the 27th as to the sentence he's received and as to the fact that as a consequence of time spent on remand, um, he was immediately due for release. So you say there was a enough, although uh, minimal, information on which the Secretary of State could reasonably make an individualised decision uh, and not a generic decision. Yes, my lord. It's been accepted throughout <coughs> these proceedings that the information before the Secretary of State is limited, and as I've already indicated, it was accepted that because that information is limited, the detention in question or the decisions in question that could be made on that basis of that information may also be um, limited. Uh, but this wasn't a case of automaticity. It wasn't a case in which a conviction in itself is the sole ground of the measure taken. 
And I say, my lord, when you... So just in terms of the information that we did have, um, we had a, a CCD2, which we don't have, so that, that's gone. Yes. Um, and, and the PMC. A and the PMC, and he had the information as to the uh, offence and the sentence for which he'd been convicted in the sentence. So that would have been on the PMC? Uh, it, it would, my lord, yes. So all he had was, and I forget the precise offence, but it was possession of a limitation firearm. That's I think, right. I think it's on, on intent. Uh, yes, I, I, I don't think it's important. Important. With intent to frighten. With, in, with intent to... What was the precise offence? I think the, 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 the offence as it's described, I believe, is possession of a limitation firearm. And I think you can see that in the supplementary bundle. Um... SB forty nine. I'm looking here at the decision of the notice of liability to deportation, which was completed on the twenty seventh of January. There's a, this, I, I accept at once, it's a secondary document, but actually at page two of that bundle is the pre-sentence report. And it says that he appeared before Ipswich Crown Court, having pleaded guilty to one count of possession of imitation firearm with intent to cause fear of violence. Yes. Well, I suppose, uh, of course, but I suppose that uh, uh, Mr. Binsky would say that was not a document available at the time to... Uh, um, uh, uh, the Home Office, and uh, that uh, the um, uh, detaining officer uh, may only have known what is said on page 249, uh, possession of an imitation firearm, without reference to any intent. Although uh, uh, at SP 48 in the IS 91, uh, you were taken earlier to that document where various risk factors are identified. Uh, and you'll see that one of the risk factors that's identified is violence towards or assaults on others. That's it, um, SB 48. 48, where is that? Uh, S supplementary bundle 48, uh, just under the heading risk factors. Uh, it, 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 it's considered that this detainee may require special monitoring or supervision due to, and you'll see at... Um, so that's a risk factor, that's looking forward. That's what might happen. Uh, it, 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 it is. I, I'm simply indicating that, that in terms of there being any foundation for a risk factor of violence towards or assaults on, on others, it is difficult to see what that could, could be if it hadn't been on the basis of... But in relation to, to 249 that sets out what, 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 what the individual had, um, we, we haven't got the CCD2, we haven't got the PMC that um, all of them had either. My, my Lord, no. So it, it seems to me that, that, that we're almost bound to accept what's on page 249, which is... Uh, that um, uh, she understood that this chap uh, had been in prison for 14 months for possession of an imitation firearm, full stop, because we haven't got any other information. Marlowe, you don't have anything beyond what, I've, be, be, beyond what you've been taking So to. All, the, all the decision maker had was um, possession of an imitation firearm, 14 months. For, my, my and uh, I just want to get, make sure that you, I've got your submission correctly. You say that that information uh, was sufficiently individualized uh, for a decision to be made to detain him pending um, obtaining further information. I, I say, my lord, that the consideration was sufficiently individualized on the basis of the information that was then available, um, and that the, the information that was available was sufficient to justify the, um, uh, the, the decision to... Um, it was to detain pending further information. The decision on an individualized basis. Yes. That you can submit. Yes. And my lord, because in, in my submission, when you, you you were taken earlier through the cases, um, or, or through some of the cases of the um, <coughs> European Court um, uh, in relation to this, um, and I don't won't necessarily ask you to turn all of those up again, but I, I do observe that in relation to the cases of Kalfa and Orphanopolis. Those were cases where the issue in question was whether or not the member states were entitled to have in place legislative measures which provided <coughs> for automatic deportation in most cases, 
with the possibility in some cases of showing compelling, particularly family-related circumstances. So those were cases of true automaticity in which the mere fact of conviction, irrespective of any individualized consideration by a decision maker, irrespective of any decision maker looking and saying, well, what can I ascertain or what can I consider on the basis of this conviction, would have the effect of an expulsion measure being taken. They were concerned with what I see as a very different situation, <coughs> that is the situation of decision makers who are doing their best with limited information in urgent circumstances. None of the authorities are looking at that situation. I should say, for the avoidance of doubt, that it's common ground that administrative decisions as well as legislation needs to comply with the requirements of EU law, which is what the court held in Rutili. My point is rather that the relevant mischief that the particular provision in issue, that is the requirement in Article 27.2 that the expulsion measure not, that, that previous criminal convictions shall not in themselves constitute grounds for taking such measures, is aimed at those cases of automaticity rather than limited information. And going back to the point that I made earlier about the importance of context and the relevance of the margin of appreciation enjoyed by the member states, the context of this decision, of course, is precisely decision to detain in order to determine whether or not to deport. I also briefly note you were taken to the case of Ulain, which is in the authorities of tab 12. And it's important to note that in that case, um, which did concern detention, there was no question at all of there being any risk or threat to public policy. And you can see that. No question of? Uh, there being any risk uh, or threat to public policy. Um, and you can see that in tab 12 of the authorities bundle at paragraph 36. You want us to get this authority out? Um, my, my lord, not necessarily if what I say is uncontroversial. Um, but the, I, I can perhaps just read what the, the, the court said. Um, the national court asked essentially whether a detention order with a view to deportation in respect of a national of another member state imposed on the basis of failure to present a valid identity card or passport, even when there is no threat to public policy, constitutes a restriction on the freedom to provide services, and if so, whether that restriction you may be justified. It would all be different if there had been a threat to public policy. Well, I say that the context in which the, the court goes on to um, uh, re refer to um, the fact that detention and deportation based solely on the basis of a failure to comply with legal formalities is, is in a very different context to a situation in which there, um, there, 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 there is offending such that um, it would be reasonable to think there may be a risk to, uh, or a threat to public policy. So it's a very different situation, differently different, as it were, from the uh, automaticity cases, which, which that was a concern. In, in respect to... Um in respect of the public policy or the public interest, uh, Article 27 there has to be a threat to uh, public policy or public interest. In, in, in this case, the public interest is what? That this chap might commit, commit further offences. 
Well, the, the, and or abscond. There, there are two aspects to the public interest at the stage where you're talking about detention with a view to um, a consideration of removal. One is that aspect in terms of the underlying point of removal itself, which is the threat that the individual uh, may pose. And the other, of course, is the risk of absconding um, pending the consideration of whether or not a removal decision should be taken. Because the power to remove would be rendered nugatory if uh, states couldn't, in appropriate cases, uh, detain individuals who may be subject to the power and might therefore go to grounds. Uh, but the, 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 the basis of this individualized assessment, that he did pose a threat to public interest in those senses, um, and, and consequently, in respect of which it would be proportionate to detain him, uh, purely to make further inquiries and obtain further information. Uh, the, the sole basis of that was uh, the, the offence and 14 months. The, 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 the offence, the sentence, and the absence of any, I suppose, if I could put it this way, the absence of any other information as to, at that time, as to circumstances that... Yeah, but I'm sure that you can rely upon the absence of information. I'm sorry, my lord, I, I mean by that not the, uh, not the absence of information before the, before the court. Um, what I mean is that there, the information you have is the, uh, the, the conviction, or the Secretary of State has the conviction uh, and the sentence. Yes, uh, the sentence full stop. Yes, in terms yes. of full stop, yes. And Mr. Bitsky points to uh, a document on which he says you wish to rely uh, at uh, 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 Bundle 2, uh, Chapter 42. Would yes. You? Uh, of the list of crimes where release from uh, immigration detention or at the end of custody would be unlikely, and here is a, a risk including uh, uh, um, possession of weapons and other firearm offences, and she says, well, that is just like having a, uh, um, uh, 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 a legislation which says uh, you uh, uh, must detain people who have committed certain offences. And my, my Lord, I, I say it isn't akin to that sort of presumption at all. Indeed, it isn't, doesn't operate as a presumption at all. If we can go back to tab 42 of the authorities bundle, um, the point that I relied upon this um, for in relation to the um, submissions made in the court below, and that I rely upon it for it now, is that um, offences, including firearms offences, have been identified as offences of particular seriousness. As my Lord Justice Hickenbottom uh, alluded to earlier, um, the requirements of public policy may differ from member state to member state, uh, and member states, it's, it's for the member states in the first instance to identify uh, what they are and how they apply in their particular context. I rely upon this to show that firearms offences are considered to be particularly serious. And I say there's nothing wrong with member states identifying that particular categories of offence will be treated as being particularly serious. It's so not akin to a... What do you mean by particularly serious? Uh, particularly serious because firearms offences might result in somebody being... Yes. Very, very significantly hurt. Yes. Um, but but we, aren't, we aren't looking backwards, we're looking forwards as to um, risk. We, we, we are, my lord, my, my, my lord yes. Um, but what it identifies is that where there's a... The, the risk of reoffending or a risk of harm arising from matters which are identified as being particularly serious, I'd say, is a factor at which you can consider in terms of whether or not the information that was available was sufficient to justify... Uh, detention in the circumstances that arose in this case. But, but there was no evidence as to propensity. There's no evidence that this individual might do this again um, because nobody knew anything about the circumstances. Well, my, my, my lord, I, I accept that, the, that at the time of the decision, obviously, that the pre-sentence report and the remarks of the sentencing judge weren't uh, weren't available. You've already been taken to the documents that show what um, uh, what was available before the secretary of state. The point I, I think that's important to note about the policy is that uh, the policy doesn't provide that there's any presumption of detention well, it does. in cases. It's unlikely to be released. Well, the, the, if you look in the in the body of the um, policy, which is what sets out the guidance to caseworkers in relation to um, detention, guidance on criminal casework in particular uh, is available from 55.3. Point A, um, which is on page 11. And you'll see 
uh, that it says there, um, uh, as has been said out above, public protection is a key consideration underpinning our detention policy. Where a foreign national offender meets the criteria for consideration of deportation, the presumption in favour of temporary admission or temporary release may well be outweighed by um, the risk of public harm from reoffending or the risk of absconding, evidence by past history and lack of respect, of respect for the law. And then over the page, you'll see that there's a section on more serious offences. Um, a conviction for one of the more serious offences. Is that a reference to the list of page 67? It is, yes. And you, and you can see that if you look just immediately above where it says more serious offences. There's a list of those offences which the Home yeah. Office considers to be more serious as set out in the list accessible here. policy I don't accept that it operates in the same way that the presumption does. And, and as authority for that, uh, you can look at um, the decision of the Supreme Court in, uh, in Lumba. Um, and that here is in the authorities bundle at uh, tab um, 25, let's pick up what the indicates. Is this? 40, uh, so just tab uh, 25. I've got it as the, as the last case in the first authorities bundle. Lumber uh, considers this document, does it? Uh, and says it's not a presumption. Uh, my, my, what it said, no, what it, what it does say, though, at paragraph 43, uh, uh, well, and indeed um, 42, sorry, I should probably start at 42, it says it's important at the outset to define clearly what a presumption means in this context. And what is the context? Um, uh, so this was the context of um, the Secretary of State's policy in relation to detaining foreign national offenders. It wasn't this was a, case, a secret policy. That's, this was the case in which there was a mismatch between the policy that the Secretary of State was actually applying and the published policy that the Secretary of State was, um, uh, was applying. He's not discussing the document of tab 42, is he? Uh, my Lord, no. But the reason I take you to this is because the Court is discussing the difference between presumptions and what's likely to happen in practice. And the point that I'm making is that a policy document which provides this is a presumption in favour of release, which is what the Secretary of State's policy on detention provides, but which has identified circumstances in which it is likely that that presumption may be outweighed, is not creating as it were, a presumption that the presumption will be outweighed. Um, and that's a preliminary point that was noted in, 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 in Lumber, paragraphs 42 
policy on detention as a whole. But I mean, you, I, I'm sorry, you, you, you have to read the, you have to read this for something. As a, as a general proposition, I accept, I accept what you say, uh, because um, a number of cases have said that things like exceptional circumstances in that phrase, exceptional really means rare. And predictive, it's not a presumption, but here it says, and although it does say in practice, uh, it's likely that the conclusion that such a person should be released would only be reached, reached where there are exceptional circumstances which clearly outweigh the risk of public harm. So um, that's quite close to a presumption, isn't it? My Lord, in my submission, Given that the policy makes clear that the presumption is, is in favour of temporary admission or, 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 or release, what it's describing in terms of what is um, highly likely in relation to um, these offences isn't, as it were, a shift from that no, no. presumption. But it's presumed that if you're this sort of an offender in respect of this offence, um, uh, there is um, a, a, a substantial risk of public harm in the future. It identifies that as being like, I, I say that it's different from a presumption where... No, I understand uh, that conceptually, yes. Yes, and I say that what the, um, the, um, the, the key mischief against which Article 27.2 is aimed is, is a presumption that operates in that uh, more, in, in that stricter sense of a presumption, i.e. something where you're saying, rather than looking at the individual circumstances and coming to a view, you're saying the presumption is this happens unless X, Y, or Z. And I say that's not what you have in relation to these more serious offences. Yeah, but this assumes that if you've committed a particular offence, a category of offence, uh, then there is a risk of public harm, a substantial risk of public harm. I, I, I don't think, my, my lord, that it goes quite as far as, as uh, quite as far as that, but it certainly points to that as being likely. Yeah. I, I would certainly accept that that, that is what the... Um, but the fundamental point, in a sense, to which... Um, as I say, which was relied upon below, was simply that um, where one is dealing with an offence which has been identified as a, a more serious category of uh, offence in, in a particular member state, that is also a factor to which regard should be had in considering whether or not the information is sufficient to justify a decision in circumstances uh, whereas in the present, or at least in circumstances where, uh, such as in the present, where... There was urgency in relation to the decision being taken. My Lord, in my submission, the judge was right to reject the suggestion that the requirements of EU law were such that the Secretary of State had to have in place some system of or pre-identification of possible deportation cases prior to the time of sentence. The judge accepted that that might be best practice or might be a better state of affairs to obtain, but in my submission he was right to reject any suggestion that that had to be in place in order for the Secretary of State to be able to take a decision of the kind that she did uh, in this case. And in my submission, de paper, the case to which you were taken by my learned friend uh, in relation to pharmaceutical products is a, is a radically different context and doesn't really assist in terms of uh, building a foundation for submission that the Secretary of State had to have in place some system of uh, <coughs> considering cases prior to sentence because any such system would obviously be first of all very wasteful in that you'd be considering uh, for deportation individuals where the sentence may be such that the Secretary of State wouldn't uh, in any event consider uh, their detention or uh, deportation and also of course in that respect potentially more um, intrusive and you'd be casting a wider net people than the system under which the Secretary of State considers um, cases on the basis of either a more serious one-off sentence <coughs> or cases of persistent offenders. You, you, you focus on the Secretary of State not knowing anything about this individual until the day of his release, which I, I understand and accept. Um, but, but the, the state, as a state, uh, knew that they were, knew that this chap was in prison, uh, knew of his circumstances as to why he was there, and knew everything that the state needed to know uh, to uh, come to a, um, a decision as to whether 
My Lord, I would say in relation, in, 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 in relation to that, um, that the, the, the judge below, um, and I would say he, he was right in, in doing this, rejected the... I, I don't think that, that, that in considering what Article 27 um, requires, um, there is an obligation to proceed on the basis that information that might be available to one part the state exercising one set of functions is necessarily available to another part of the state exercising different functions. At the point at which he was in sentence on remand, there was a period of time prior to his uh, entering a guilty plea. Once he pleaded guilty, of course, there was then awareness that he'd um, committed an offence because he had accepted that he'd committed an offence and was awaiting a uh, sentence. But at a time when it wasn't yet known what that sentence would be, and it therefore wasn't yet known whether he was an individual whom the state would even consider removing or deporting, um, requiring the state to put in the resources of considering whether or not he should be removed when he wouldn't have met the state's own thresholds in terms of even considering taking that step would be, in my submission, unduly burdensome and unreasonable. As well, I say, as, of course, widening the net of individuals who would then find themselves under consideration for, uh, for deportation. But the, but, but the state, before sentence, the state knew the precise circumstances of the offence. Of course, the, the, the Ministry of Justice knew. Um, so the state, as, as a state, didn't need to know that My Lord, the point I make is that in terms of um, states considering or having in, in place systems under which they will consider for deportation only people who are persistent offenders or people whose offending reaches a particular level of seriousness, that is, if anything, a protective measure that states are taking. It's a measure favourable to uh, EEA nationally rather than one that uh, is, as it were, um, against them. Because, of course, prior to conviction um, uh, and sentence, what the state, is it, is it the state doesn't know the the seriousness of the, um, uh, well, and, until conviction, the state doesn't know that the offence has necessarily been would, committed. Was he convicted? Did he plead guilty on the 27th of January? Uh, no, he pleaded guilty, I believe, at, on a date in December. Um, I can bring that, or it may have been... It's not clear, insofar as I've seen it, when he pleaded guilty. The uh, first pre-sentence report was requested in December, and what... I haven't found out from papers as what credit was given for a guilty plea, which generally indicates when that plea is entered. Um, my lady, I'm just checking to see whether... Yes, on, on, on the 4th of December 2014, I'm looking here in the core bundle at 157, the chronology. Sorry, page? Uh, 157 of the core bundle. Trigger for the pre-sentence report. Uh, my lady, yes, that would be right. The judge in his sentencing remark, the recorder does say something about this. I uh, uh, don't precisely recall, but I thought he said that he'd be guilty at the first opportunity. Where do we have the judge's sentencing remarks? Uh, we've got that uh, at two four five of the supplementary bundle. Um, and it says there, uh, I have come to the conclusion that in this case, were it not for your discount, I would have passed the sentence of 21 months imprisonment. But given your early plea, I should discount that to 14 months. So in other words, he got full credit. So that would have been a guilty plea at the earliest reasonable opportunity. Yes. But I, I think in terms of dates, on the basis of the chronology of the ACA, I believe it's the of December. That's hardly the first opportunity. That, but that's unlikely to be the first reasonable opportunity. Um, it's In any event, a third discount was given, which means the judge acknowledged it was the first reasonable opportunity. Yes. Which means 
generally it means the first appearance the um, defendant would have made in the Crown Court at uh, a plea and case management hearing, generally. Yeah. I, I, I really That's what judges usually mean by uh, first opportunity, yeah. yes. If, if, I can, uh, if I can insist further in relation to that, I, I, I will relate to the date, but if the agreed chronology had us at the 4th of December, um, uh, the offence that we committed on the 14th of June, you know, he just calls it an early plea of guilty, doesn't he? He doesn't say the first opportunity. If, he ple if the offence was on the 14th of June, I would be surprised, but I can't put it any higher than that, that his first appearance in the Crown Court was in December. He would have got there quicker. Yes. Certainly should have done. Yeah. Yes, well, that's what I said. <laughs> but, but by the 31st of December, which is when the uh, um, pre sentence report was prepared, and presumably given to the state in one manifestation or another, uh, the state knew that this man posed um, a low risk of serious harm to the public, a low risk of reoffending, and, and a medium risk to a and an adult. Correct. Accept that. Uh, but but the, the, the state, I, I appreciate you distinguish the two arms of the state, but the state knew that. Well, my, my, my own certainly, certainly part of it is yes. I, I, I would accept that, sir. Yes. But as I say, the, the issue is then in terms of considering whether or not to uh, deport uh, or, or remove or not, whether the Secretary of State wouldn't but, but, ordinarily but, but, consider. But, but at some point on these facts, the Home Secretary was going to consider deporting this man. If his sentence uh, was... No, on, 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 on the facts of the case. On the facts of the case. On the basis of sentence. Well, my lord, if, 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 if for a first offence um, uh, an individual is, is uh, given a, a lower sentence, it won't necessarily then fall for consideration for removal or deportation. Just on, just on the basis yeah, of sentence. I, I, can, I, I will see if I can... No, no, you may be, no, you may be wrong. To figure out the reference in relation to that, in terms of, as it were, a threshold for consideration. Yes. Um, my, my other brief points, if I may, just in relation to the applicable legal principles, you were taken to the cases of um, Kay and uh, Shodor. Um, uh, these are both cases in which the... Um, European Court was considering uh, the exercise of specific powers to detain um, uh, in respectively the, the Dublin III regulation in the case of Chodor uh, and in relation to the reception directive um, in the case of uh, Kay, both concerned with third country uh, nationals, uh, neither uh, concerned with situations in which removal is sought on grounds of public policy. In, in my submission, it's difficult to see that they therefore have much bearing in relation to the present case. And, and certainly, I, I don't accept that one can view the present case as being, from the claimant's perspective, a fortiori, whatever is said in relation to those cases, because the claimant is an EEA national, and the individuals in those cases were non-EEA nationals, because the circumstances are completely different. The public policy aims of the relevant EU legislation are completely different from the aims of uh, removal on public policy grounds under the Citizens Directive. Um, and in relation to that, um, I would just refer you, if I may, to um, what the Supreme Court said in relation to a similar argument in New Asli, um, where a similar argument was made on the basis of the decision of the Court of Justice in a case called JN. Um, JN isn't in the um, authorities uh, bundle, um, and there's no need for the courts to um, uh, to look at it, um, but in the postscript to Lord Clark's judgment, uh, which appears at tab 33, submissions that were made by the claimants in that case on the basis 
decision in JN. And at paragraph 89, you notice the submission was that where in the implementation of EU law a member state authorizes administrative detention prior to expulsion and seeks to justify it on public order grounds, first, the member state must previously inform the concluded view as to the threat posed to public order by the individual and must have balanced that against interference with liberty. Um, uh, and Second, administrative detention first expulsion that must be uh, necessary. Um, and then at paragraph 90, uh, there's a reference that was made to um, the JN case. And of course, to note that the test applied by the court in, in JN was no different from that. Um, I simply note what was then said at 93 and 94 Yes, I'm, I'm not understanding why we're reading this. I, I'm sorry, my Lord, it's simply a point in rebuttal, but as I understand it, the claimant seeks to argue by reference to um, Schroeder or, or um, uh, the K um, uh, cases that they have a bearing in the approach that the court should be taken towards the interpretation of Article um, 27 of the Citizens Directive. And I'm simply pointing to the fact that the Supreme Court in Rasli um, rejected a structurally similar submission on the basis that what the European Court in the Chodor and, uh, so sorry, in, in the JN case was doing, was construing a specific EU law measure. Well, you say, you know, that um, uh, uh, the uh, ultimate it really is a question of fact. Uh, it's for the judge to decide whether or not the Secretary of State automatically um, decided to detain because of the previous convictions rather than making an individualised uh, uh, decision. Uh, the judge finds he did not make an automatic decision, yes. that he did have regard to the limited uh, 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 information, um, uh, uh, which was no more than the uh, uh, conviction, uh, the uh, uh, sentence for which he was convicted, and uh, well, the, the offence of which he was convicted and the sentence, but that that was uh, permissible as long as it wasn't an automatic uh, uh, decision. Yes, and, and plainly w would justify a, a, a very limited, uh, a, a limited period. And if necessary, you also support the judge's uh, view uh, that uh, uh, it would impose a burden on the Home Secretary, an unreasonable burden on the Home Secretary, to uh, uh, have to take preemptive uh, action uh, in the case of every foreign national offender um, uh, in case the sentence turned out to be uh, so short as to permit immediate release. E every e e e EEA national offender. Yes, my lord. Yes. Yes. Um, well, that's really it, isn't it? On stage one. My lord, from, from me, yes. With, with one very short caveat, my apologies. I've just taken you to, I realise I didn't take you, it was 95 of New Asley. Um, just the sentence, I would accept submission made on behalf of the Secretary of State for the Court of Justice. This is with reference to JN. I did not lay down minimum criteria that must be satisfied in all cases within the scope of EU law. But in terms of the submissions on what, what my, my lord has said is, is effectively the nub of the Secretary of State's, um, of the Secretary of State's case. Yes. Um, right. Well, let's go to stage four. Uh, 
My lord, yes. So in stage four, we have to deal with two submissions, a maximalist and a minimalist submission, as they've been categorized. Um, uh, if I can begin, my lord, uh, with the minimalist um, uh, submission, or no, my lord, sorry, I'll, I'll take it in the other order if I may and begin with the maximalist submission. So the maximalist submission is that um, from the point of the judicial review being issued or shortly thereafter, detention became contrary to the Hardeel Singh principles. Um, uh, in my submission, there's, there's no merit uh, in, that, um, uh, in, in that argument. The claimant's pleaded case was that there was a breach of the third of the Hardeel Singh principles, which is the principle that uh, detention uh, should not continue once it becomes apparent that removal can't be effected within a, a reasonable period of time. That's the third Hardeel Singh principle. Um, the fourth Hardeel Singh principle, of course, is that the Secretary of State must act with due expedition in taking steps with a view to effecting a person's removal. That's a separate and distinct principle. And I think it's important to note, in terms of the way the claimant's arguments have developed before this court, that the claimant has never pleaded that there was a breach of that principle. Um, because the claimant's maximalist submission, as I understand it, is that the Secretary of State should have taken steps to expedite more quickly than the Secretary of State did. But that, in reality, is a Hardy or Four type submission. It's not a Hardy or Three type submission. The Hardy or Three type submission requires the court to ask the simple question, was it apparent that removal couldn't be effected within a reasonable period of time? How can it be said that that was apparent um, uh, at any event at any time prior to the decision, um, uh, prior to the hearing on the 31st of March, when uh, the Secretary of State uh, could well have made an application for the claim for judicial review to be expedited? It, it can't be said that it was apparent that the claim for judicial review would rumble on for such a period uh, that, that, it, that it could be said that removal would be affected reasonably. Well, the claim, the claim for judicial review takes three days. It's not going to be decided within three months of issue, is it? I, I'm, I'm sorry, my lord. I, oh, uh, my, my lord, oh, the, 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 the claim in the form in which it was considered by the learned judge was quite different from the claim as it was at the outset as a challenge to certification and, um, uh, and detention. I don't accept my learned friend's argument that because the claim embraced challenges to a number of aspects of the Secretary of State's policy in relation to certification um, uh, and in relation to the um, regulations, that, that that means that this was a claim uh, that would necessarily have taken, uh, wouldn't have been determined within a reasonable um, period of time, uh, or that it's a claim that wouldn't have been uh, suitable for expedition, potentially. Um, uh, the claimant's own facts in relation to the challenge, and that's crucial in terms of the value of the challenge to removal, and it's only the challenge to removal, not the challenge to detention, that would operate as a barrier, um, as a barrier um, to removal, were, in my submission, always very weak. Fundamentally, this was a case in which the claimant challenged the certification on Article 8 grounds or maintained that he had a, a good Article 8 claim to resist his removal to Lithuania pending the hearing of his appeal. In circumstances where he was uh, a young man from Lithuania who at the relevant time wasn't in contact with um, his child in relation to whom removal would have been for only a period of time pending the appeal because as an EEA national he never had a right uh, to uh, return to present the appeal um, in person and there were no health or medical or other sorts of issues that stood in his favour. So when the judge comes to look at the challenge to the certification, although the judge accepts on the basis of authority that had um, been promulgated uh, in the intervening period, that the Secretary of State hadn't properly uh, uh, hadn't applied the right test, 
the judge also concluded that it made no material difference because the claimant's Article 8 challenge uh, was one that couldn't succeed. Um, and so my submission in terms of the actual uh, nub of the judicial review in terms of the practical question of the challenge to the claimant's removal this isn't a particularly complicated um, case. In any event, as the judge um, uh, recognised, it was open to the Secretary of State to seek expedition. Now, the claimants advance a number of arguments as to what was happening between the issue of the judicial review and the interim relief hearing, or the filing of the acknowledgement of service, and the interim relief hearing, which they say show that the, Hardial, the third Hardial Singh principle can't, uh, uh, sorry, the, the, the third Hardial principle is a claim in which they succeed. But it's difficult to see how any of those arguments show that at any time on their maximalist submission, it was apparent that the claimant couldn't be removed within a reasonable period of time. Do you accept that um, expedition was required to remove the claims within a reasonable time? Uh, my Lord, no, not necessarily. Um, and um, the Secretary of State's case before the judge below was that the whole of the period of detention was, um, uh, was justified. Um, obviously, we lost in relation to part of that. But a hardy or sing challenge in terms of when this court should intervene. This court should intervene only if it's clear that there's some error of um, principle that's involved in the decision making. If I can take you perhaps just to the case of Mukhtar, um, uh, which is in the authorities bundle. The, 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 the Secretary of State didn't go about expediting this or thinking about expediting it optimally. My understanding is that the um, Department of Service went in about two or three days before the end of the maximum period. Is that right? That's right, my lord, yes. Uh, and it didn't contain a, a, an application to expedite. That's right, my lord, yes. Could it be said that um, three months is the, um, the, the maximum period? Um, I mean, is that, is that expedition? Was, was, was not the time for expedition? I mean, it, well, my lord, the, the, the judge recognised that there is, as it were, an unexplained delay in terms of why the Secretary of State didn't seek expedition at an earlier stage. That forms part of the judge's um, reasoning uh, in relation to why he concluded that um, detention was unlawful from the 9th of April. Um, my point is that, that if it's said that there is a failure on the part of the Secretary of State to apply for expedition at an earlier point in time, how does that go to the Ardeal Singh 3 question, which is whether it's apparent that he can't be removed within a reasonable period of time. And in my submission, it doesn't, because expedition could still have been sought. And if we look at the judge's reasoning, um, and we take it as a whole, um, uh, I'm looking down the core bundle, um, from 167 onwards, uh, and it's page 203. Page 2? Two. 203. Yes. So, the claim for judicial review had been uh, issued on around the 11th of March 2015. The detention review on the 23rd of March, 2015, summarized at 82, and the judge noted that expedition was a real prospect at that stage. The acknowledgement of service was due on the 30th, and interim hearing uh, was fixed for the 31st. The judge himself was satisfied that there was a need for um, uh, expedition. He then goes at three. I'm sorry, the, 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 the oral interim relief hearing, that, that was an application by the claimant. That's right, my lord, yes. The claimant has applied for an interim relief in the form of an order for their release from detention, which wasn't then pursued on the day 
um, in light of the disclosure of the OASIS report identifying the claims as posing a uh, high risk of uh, harm. Wasn't pursued to because there was a new pre sentence report which you needed consideration. Yes, that's right. Um, but, but, but there's no evidence that the Secretary of State has done anything. Well, the, the Secretary of State filed the acknowledgement of service in, uh, in time, um, but, but yes, the, the, the judge proceeds on the basis, which is right, that the Secretary of State didn't seek expedition, either in the acknowledgement of service or at the, um, or at the hearing. There was no dispute as to that. What the judge then goes on to say at three is that by the time of the authorization of detention on the 9th of April, the situation had changed because the opportunity to seek expedition hadn't been, um, uh, hadn't been followed up to the point that my Lord, uh, that my Lord makes. Um, then at 4, and I think it is important also to look at 4, not so much the text construing a particular sentence of the detention review, um, but the judge notes um, that... Um, the reviewing officer considered that pending an adverse decision in the judicial review, it was continued that deportation could take place within a reasonable time scale. Um, the judge considered that that wasn't so because the matter hadn't by that point been expedited. And then he says in his last sentence, the perfect opportunity to do so had come and gone and no other plan to achieve it was identified. And he then says that in light of that, it was apparent as at the 9th of April, in light of what had gone before, that there was no longer a realistic prospect of removal within a reasonable time. Uh, within a reasonable time. Now, I emphasise that um, that last sentence, the perfect opportunity to do so has come and gone, and no other plan to achieve it was identified, because it isn't right to say that no steps could have been taken by the Secretary of State, even at that stage, in terms of trying to bring the matter on for that resolution. Because as you'll have seen from the order of Mrs Justice McGowan, the matter was, of course, listed for further at hearing after the 20th of April. Um, so in, in my submission, the judge was entitled to consider that the point uh, from which um, uh, there was a, a, a breach of Article 3 was uh, the 9th of April. It wasn't simply the fact of the acknowledgement of service having gone in and the hearing having happened. It was the fact of that coupled with um, the fact that there wasn't a any plan at that time. Seems that this is an error of un unreality um, because it's like treating the Secretary of State as a third party. Um, the, the, the Secretary of State could have expedited this matter in a number of ways or could have applied to expedite this matter by making an application to the court. There's no evidence that, is the, that the Secretary of State even thought about expediting. Well, the, 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 de the detention review that, um, uh, of immigration officer uh, Holton uh, in, in indicated that that officer had uh, considered that there was a need to ensure that the judicial review was expedited, but, but that wasn't followed up. No, so, so it was recognised that expedi expedition was necessary, but no steps, no evidence at all of any steps being taken to expedite it. But what I say, my lord, that in, in terms of what the... What, what, what that means in terms of party or sing three is that once the opportunity, it, w it would be open to a court to conclude that once the opportunity to expedite had passed and the opportunity was the acknowledgement of service or the hearing before um, uh, McGowan J, um, a, a court could conclude that at that point in time uh, it had become apparent that uh, there wasn't a real prospect of removal within a reasonable period of time. Uh, until that point in time, I don't see how a court could plausibly reach that conclusion, because the question was always whether it was apparent that removal couldn't take place. Had the secretary? I'm sorry, but apparent to whom? The secretary of state. The secretary of state understood that it was necessary to expedite it um, uh, in, in order to um, remove this man within a reasonable time, um, and then took. No evidence that any steps were taken to do that. And so the starting point is that without expedition, we can't remove this man within a reasonable time. And then the Secretary of State simply did not take any steps. So the, the question, at the, the point at which the Hardy or Singh 3 principle could, uh, a court could conclude that that had been breached, would be the point at which 
the Secretary of State could no longer take the step of seeking expedition. But it doesn't come until that point. So long as the Secretary of State can still take that step, there is no breach of, of, of Hardy or Singh III. If, if, if we look but to I, what's... I find that very difficult to, to take. I mean, the, the Secretary of State might have tried to expedite some other aspect of these fairly long-running proceedings, but the, the starting point is, isn't it, that without expedition, this man cannot be uh, removed uh, within a reasonable time. Now, the, the Secretary of State can come and say, well, ah, yes, but we are going to expedite it, and we have taken steps to expedite it, and therefore uh, we can remove him in, in a reasonable time. It, it, the Secretary of State surely can't just hang on to this man in detention um, and, until the... Uh, uh, until uh, the uh, hypothetical opportunity uh, to expedite that time has passed because there's, there's, no, there's no expedition steps going on. My Lord, in, in terms of the, the, the analysis that the court should be applying, and, I, and I, once I've addressed your, your point, I'd briefly like to, to take the court to, to, um, to Mokhtar. The question is, in terms of Hardy or Singh three, is whether it's apparent that removal can't take place within a reasonable period of time. That's the only question that the court is looking to. If the Secretary of State can, is no longer in a position to uh, take a step to expedite matters, then a court may conclude at that juncture that it's become apparent that um, removal isn't going to take place within a reasonable time. But you're, uh, I don't at, but, I'm sorry, but you're looking at it from the court's point of view. Yes. Shouldn't we be looking at it from what was apparent to the Secretary of State? My lord, no. Uh, in my submission, no. The, 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 the question in terms of the Hardy or Singh challenge, when the court's considering the Hardy or Singh principles, is always a decision for the court to make on the basis of, of the information before the Secretary of State. But the person who's got the obligation to release him is not the court under Hardy or Singh, it's the Secretary of State. It's, it's whether, the, se it's whether the, the Secretary of State is bound to release him under Hardy or Singh bound to release him under Hardy or Singh uh, if, if it's apparent to him uh, that he's not going to be able to release, uh, not going to be able to remove the individual within a reasonable time. Yes. But my point is that it can't be apparent to the Secretary of State that that's not going to happen uh, until an opportunity for that expedition to be sought has passed. While that opportunity is still there, it can't be said that it's apparent that it's not going to be fulfilled or realized. E even, when the e even when there's no evidence Secretary of State is even contemplating um, active steps to expedite. Well, my lord, uh, th that's where I, I, I don't accept that, it, that, 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 the, that there is no evidence that the Secretary even contemplates, because Im Immigration Op Officer Holtby's um, uh, detention review on the 23rd of March indicates that um, indicates well, it indicates that expedition is being it, it is something that the Secretary of State is. Um, Going to give consideration to because well, there's certainly a recognition that expedition is required if, if he's going to be uh, removed in a reasonable time. Well, I, I, I say, my lord, that that in, in, in is sufficient in terms of the uh, of, of identifying that, um, uh, that that expedition remains a. Um, uh, a possibility um, uh, and is in, in play. You'll see the reference, of course, there to the uh, immigration officer indicating that he'll raise that issue with the, the assistant director for the uh, for the judicial review team. Now, as I say, we know that that doesn't in the event happen, but it's rather like uh, in uh, situations where, for example, an, an emergency travel document or whatever is to be sought, or other steps are to be taken in order to fulfil uh, to facilitate removal. If one of those steps, or so long as those steps are open, and from the point of view of the Hardy or Singh question, is it apparent that somebody isn't going to be um, removed within a reasonable period of time? Well, the answer is no, it isn't. There's a different principle which is concerned with the question whether or not the Secretary of State has uh, taken steps to progress matters as quickly as the Secretary of State can. That's the fourth Hardy or Singh principle, but there was never any pleaded challenge on the basis of the fourth Hardy or Singh um, uh, principle. And in my submission, effectively, what the uh, claimant's arguments would do is conflate those two principles, or at least bring 
as it were, for within um, three, when that was never the case that the Secretary of State faced in this, um, uh, in this claim. And, and the various ways in which that's, that's put in the appeal, in my submission, effectively amounts to that. If I can just briefly take you to the, um, uh, the uh, authorities, I say, as I say, in relation to that um, principle, we have, uh, in particular, uh, Mukhtar, which is at tab 27. Now, what are you citing this uh, authority for? Um, my Lord, this authority I cite for um, several propositions. Um, uh, the first is the proposition that one shouldn't water down the requirement that it be apparent that a decision of ongoing proceedings will drag on for so long that removal couldn't take place within a reasonable period of time. And you get that uh, from paragraph 36 of the decision on page 661. which follows on from the court's recognition, and I think this is pertinent to note, that even in that case where it's considered um, that the prospects of the relevant applications uh, to the European Court had uh, good, had reasonable to good prospects of success, still the court stressed that apparent, uh, because that's the word used in the approval formulation, and it's important not to water it down so as to cover situations where the prospect of removal in a reasonable period is nearly uncertain. That's the first. Um, um, but in, in this case, um, uh, from recollection, um, the uh, difficulty in removing uh, this individual to Somalia were conditions in Mogadishu. The, the, the difficulty though, was that there was a Rule 39 um, uh, direction in place from the European Court of Strasbourg, which was considering um, uh, uh, a Lee's case in relation to conditions in um, Mogadishu. Uh, Mogadishu. So what was, what, what was halting the uh, removal was not in the Secretary of State's hands. Well, what was halting the removal was the European Court of Human Rights um, exactly. uh, proceedings. In, in the same way as what was preventing removal of the claimant in the present case was the uh, claim for judicial review. The barrier to removal uh, in the present case was the fact that there was a, uh, a live claim uh, uh, for judicial review. I, I'm not sure that I've, I've, I've satisfied your, your, your relationship with my, well, no, my, my... I understand that that was a technical yeah. barrier, but the, the practical reason um, was expedition. Was judicial review plus expedition equals reasonable time. Yes, but the question is, if you're asking when, is it, when does it become apparent that uh, a matter can't be, well, it doesn't become apparent until expedition can no longer be achieved. So long as expedition can still be achieved, it can't be said that it's apparent that judicial review won't proceed within a reasonable period of time. And as I say, the, it, it's quite a different case, and not a case that was pleaded below, to say that there is an error of law on the part of the Secretary of State, or that detention is unlawful because the Secretary of State didn't apply expedited at an earlier point in time. Um, the other propositions that I um, would invite you to take from uh, Mukhtar are just at paragraph um, 45 and I take you to that because one of the issues in uh, Mukhtar concerned the period after the European Court had reached uh, judgment. And the consequence of the European Court's judgment was, in that case, that the claimant couldn't, in fact, be removed to Mogadishu. Um, and, and as a consequence, would have to be um, uh, released. Uh, and there was a period between 
um, that judgment uh, and um, release and a question as to whether or not that period was unlawful on the grounds that the Secretary of State should have more promptly considered the implications of his decision in Abdi and released um, the claimant. Um, uh, and I just pause to note that the court there uh, didn't think that the reasonable time for conducting such assessments could be set to have an outer limit of one week, or that it ought to have been apparent to the Secretary of State within that time that there was no realistic prospect of removing the claimant within a reasonable period of time. So having had the adverse judgment of the uh, court in Strasbourg, then the next sentence, and I'm here looking at E um, in the sideline, the court recognised that there was indeed some force in the Secretary of State's Are you reading now? I'm sorry, my lord. Um, uh, this is in uh, E on page 664 of Mukhtar, paragraph 45. There is indeed some force. There is indeed some force in the Secretary of State's argument it was reasonable to wait until the claimant's next detention review. This is one of the central purposes of monthly reviews is to ensure that the justification for continued detention is reassessed on a regular basis in the light of up-to-date available information, including any changes in circumstances. As my Lord says, that was all about uh, conditions in Mogadishu, or at least uh, the court's view about that. Well, my Lord, although at this point in the judgment, what um, uh, Lord Justice Richards is addressing is the situation in which the judgment has already been delivered, um, uh, which effectively said no to removals to Mogadishu. And the point was that the Secretary of State was entitled to some time to consider the implications of that that judgment before. But he's obviously entitled to read the judgment. What else is he entitled to do? Well, in, 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 that, in that case, um, uh, my lord, there was a period um, of, I think, nine days. Um, but at any event, a period uh, of. The, the, the immigration judge granted bail on the 13th of July. The um, court handed down its judgment on the 28th of June. So the 28th of June, 2011, the European Court had handed down the judgment um, in the leading case on removals, which effectively said removals couldn't take place. Um, the claimant in that case was then granted bail on the 13th of July. So. 14 or so days after the judgment of the European Court of Human Rights had been handed down, um, he was released by the First Tier Tribunal on bail. Um, and the court accepted that that period after the adverse decision uh, remained lawful from the, purpose, the purposes of the third cardinal same principle. Um, and I take you to that reference there to there being some force in the Secretary of State's of argument it was reasonable to wait until the next detention review. As indicated in the Scavenger argument, it wasn't the Secretary of State's case below, and it isn't the Secretary of State's case now, that there is any, or should be, uh, any ne necessary correlation between the dates on which there's a finding that there's been a breach of the hard or Singh principles and the dates on which an individual's detention is going to be yeah, reviewed. Yeah, 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 you made that clear. What the, I'm not clear about is what the second yeah. proposition is, which you're citing this case. Uh, Ah, well, my lord, so one is the point that there is nonetheless th 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 recognised some force in the um, point about it being reasonable to wait until the detention review. Because I say that although the judge isn't required to take that approach... The proposition is the Secretary is entitled to time to do what? Um, my lord, to consider... Uh, the Secretary of State's position in light of any developments that have a bearing on whether removal can be effected within a reasonable period of time. And in this case, and the developments which might have a bearing on that were what? Well, my lord, in, in the first instance, there's the, the issue of the claim for judicial review. And on that, as I've already submitted, so long as, on the basis of the judge's findings at least, so long as it remains possible for the Secretary of State to seek expedition, I say it can't be said that it's apparent that the removal can't be effected within a reasonable period of time. The judge in his judgment, 
referred to the fact that the opportunity in the acknowledgement of service and the hearing had been missed. But his judgment was given by reference to the detention review on the 9th of April because, as he noted, at that time the opportunity had been missed and there was no alternative plan in place. And I emphasize those words because, in my submission, effectively, the uh, judge is not, I think, on the basis of what he says in his judgment, applying any principle or rule that Hardy or Singh necessarily tracks detention reviews. He's weighing up all of the relevant factors and concluding that the 9th of April is the point at which it can be said you've missed that chance, you don't have any plan in place now to achieve things more quickly, therefore that's the point at which I find there's a breach of party or something. He's missed his chance, but he's entitled to some further time to consider the consequences of missing the chance. And that well, takes you to the 9th of April. Plan. I mean, as I, as I indicated, it, it's not entirely speculation to think that, that, that steps could have been taken at that, even at that juncture, because the matter was listed to come for a further hearing before the court in... Uh, in, in so it's not truly apparent until the 9th of April, that's your point. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. And, and, and I say finally, what I get from Mukhtar um, is what the court then says, at the lined paragraphs 46 to 48. Uh, and the short proposition here is that this court... Yeah, we're always being referred to this proposition, yes, and that you shouldn't second guess the first instance judge uh, yes. is an evaluation for him, yes. Yes, and I say that in this case, you've not been taken to anything showing that the judge misdirected himself in relation to what the relevant principles were. He's expressed his reasons clearly uh, in uh, paragraph 80 of his judgment, plainly being in full possession of the uh, relevant facts, including the fact that the Secretary of State had uh, missed the uh, seeking of expedition in the AOS and, and thing. And he's reached a conclusion that the 9th of April was the appropriate date from which to consider it was apparent that removal was... I, I say that betrays no error of principle with which this court should interfere. It was plainly a conclusion open to the judge. The judge could have been with the Secretary of State and concluded that um, the whole period was um, lawful. And if authority was needed as to the fact that expedition was always required, um, uh, I note that in Hamati, although in the context of a dissenting judgment, there were no other judges who had to consider this particular point, nor just to sales noted in that case that um, uh, the fact that a judicial review isn't expedited doesn't necessarily mean that it will uh, operate as a, um, uh, a barrier to removal within a reasonable period of time. The reference for that um, is um, uh, tab 39, paragraph um, One five six to one five seven. And having regard to all the various factors that were in play in this case, including what the judge had accepted about the Secretary of State's or the legitimacy of the Secretary of State's assessments in relation to risk, and bearing in mind as well that just as the claimant sought to adjourn the hearing and agreed to adjourn the hearing on the 31st of March because the claimant wanted an opportunity to consider the OASIS assessment with the higher assessment of risk. That's also a matter which was relevant for the Secretary of State to consider. And the risk of harm is, is plainly a relevant factor when considering whether or not detention can lawfully be maintained. So again... That, in my submission, would be another reason why one can see that it was open to the judge to consider that the 9th of April was the appropriate date rather than the 31st. My Lords, I, I, my lady, I don't know if you want me to address you in relation to some of the specific points that were raised in the claims written ground in regards to the Cartona principle um, and the various other ways in which their case on this issue were 
books. Um, I've obviously addressed them in, uh, in writing and can do so now uh, briefly as well, if that would assist. Yes, I think we can move to your appeal. Uh, I, I should move on, or, or would you like me to address you on those? Sorry, my lord. I suggest you go to your own appeal now. Thank you, my lord. Well, my lord, so far then as the Secretary of State's appeal is concerned, there are obviously two issues in relation to the second period of detention. Oh, I see it is actually uh, 13 minutes past four. But perhaps it's more sensible to give a short appeal tomorrow. Uh, right, uh, so uh, tomorrow we'll deal with your appeal and uh, Mr. Binsky will have an opportunity to reply on your submissions this afternoon. Right. On the mic, please. Yeah. I, I, I would certainly have thought by long I mean, given they're trying to move us on a bit, I thought, I thought very much again this morning for trying to have a hearing loop. Hopefully we'll have the other one by tomorrow. <laughs>